here's the church here is the steeple open the zoom door and all see right. all the people <laughs> well if everybody is all set um we'll start i'm mary hare graham and i'm a member of the cathedral bookstore board and i go to st luke's in atlanta and i am here to welcome everybody for a really special virtual event and it's a discussion with Diana Butler Bass and Dean Sam Candler. Um, and it's about uh, Diana's new book called Freeing Jesus. And the book is available in the Cathedral Bookstore and you can get copies with a signed book plate in them. So it's kind of a special thing. So hop on over or place an order at the bookstore for her book. Um, Diana Butler Bass, she is an award winning author of 11 books, including this book tonight. She's a speaker, she's a teacher, a preacher, and she's a commentator on religion and contemporary spirituality, especially where faith intersects with politics and culture. The very Reverend Sam Candler is the Dean of the Cathedral of St. Philip in Atlanta. And he has been there since 1998. He also is a writer, a teacher, and a preacher um, in the United States, as well as in the larger Anglican community. He also is really enjoying his jazz piano playing during this time. Um, <laughs> the format for tonight, uh, we'll have discussion between Sam and Diana until about 7.35, at which time we'll open it up for questions. Now, if you will please place your questions in the chat box, we'll take the questions from there rather than having an open forum when you unmute and ask a question. So if you could please um, honor that. Um, let's see. I think that's about it. And I'm really excited to hear from these two people. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Sam and Diana, to start your conversation. And thank you very much for being here. And thanks to everybody else for joining us. Thank you, Mary Hare. And um, I, I guess I'll, I too will welcome all of you as, as the Dean of the Cathedral of St. Philip. Uh, on behalf of this parish and this very scattered community, I welcome you to the scattered community of the Cathedral of St. Philip and the Cathedral Bookstore. It's a, it's a large and complicated and complex place, but it's made holy by your prayer. So every time you come to the bookstore, leave a prayer. Every time you come to the cathedral, leave a prayer. Every time you go to a Zoom screen, leave a prayer, and this community will somehow be, be sanctified. I too welcome Diana. It's good to see her face on this screen, and I'm glad to have the bookstore uh, hosting her and hearing something about her work. And upon and and on this book, freeing Jesus, I'm I'm gonna ask a, a first question, or just kind of get things going, and let Diana do uh, as much of the talking as she wants. It was a uh, it was a fun book for me to read, and especially uh, for me personally, as kind of Diana went through her some real crisis points, or at least turning points in her own life, uh, really kind of framing her thoughts around these. Um, these points where there was some experience of the holy, some experience of Jesus that she named in these beautiful titles. And then at the end, we hear her kind of describe this format as, as memoir theology, uh, really kind of a long line, she would say, of, of theology. Everybody is speaking from experience and from their memoir. So I appreciated that piece of it. And um, as kind of a, an, a question to get... Um, Diana talking, I would, I would ask this one. Um, tell, us, uh, tell us about some of the communities, the communities where you had these, um, these, these beautiful experiences of Jesus. That You mentioned several churches, and there are different kinds of churches, and there are different kinds of communities, but, but uh, which ones do you recall uh, in particular as having been a blessing for you, which of those, where did those communities bless you in any way? Oh, that's a really, that's a really interesting question, Sam, because 
since the book is structured around telling telling my story and telling the story of Jesus, um, that means I move through chronological time and I follow my my own journey of of spiritual growth. Interestingly enough, uh, the book, the very first vignette in the book takes place at the Washington National Cathedral. And uh, it tells a tale of one time when I was praying there at the altar and it was, I was in the side chapel. Some people in the audience might know the place, the side chapel of the Holy Spirit, one of my favorite places in Washington, D.C. It's amazing painting above the altar of Jesus that was painted by N.C. Wyatt about 120 years ago. And so I was, I was there at the altar and I was really struggling, you know, wrestling with God. And um, I looked, I, I, I just kind of stopped praying for a second. I was like, where are you, God? Where are you? And I heard this voice say to me, get me out of here. And it was so distinctive. I thought that someone had walked into the chapel. And was like, you know, get me out of here. There's already someone in here praying. And I, 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 I just kind of turned around. There was no one there. And uh, I heard the voice a second time. Get me out of here. <laughs> it was like, I looked up at the painting. Jesus, is, is that you? And lo and behold, um, I heard an out loud voice at the Washington National Cathedral uh, from Jesus asking me, as my husband later said to me when I told him what had happened, asking him me to spring him from the slammer. And so it's a strange thing to start a book there, uh, you know, as an Episcopalian and to have Jesus be requesting uh, to be released. Uh, but, you know, it was a it was a blessing because what I really didn't understand at that moment when I, when this episode occurred in 2013 was there was going to be a need, I think, uh, for all of us to understand what it meant to take Jesus out into the world. And so this, this book really traces that story. And so then, uh, you know, that's the opening vignette takes place in a very familiar space to people on this um, Zoom that will be Episcopalians. But it also works um, in really nostalgic uh, sorts of voices, I think, uh, with my childhood Methodist church in Baltimore, and then a little bit of the Methodist church that my parents joined when we moved to Scottsdale, Arizona in 1972. But I didn't stay in that church very long. Um, when I was an adolescent, I went uh, to a different church, and that was a very, very uh, now large um, Bible church independent you you all live in uh, many of you live in Atlanta or in the south and so you know what these churches are like and I I don't really talk about it a lot and I haven't written about it very much so people who are fans of my work won't know until now um, that I spent a significant amount of time within evangelicalism and so even though I feel awkward in some ways about that that community. I also embrace it in a new way in this book and try to pull out of it um, what really did turn into blessing my life. And, and from there, I move on to um, uh, college I attended, and that's really located within the context of college rather than specific church. And then finally, um, on to the Episcopal Church uh, when I was in seminary. And so there are churches that show up because there are churches I went to. Um, and uh, then there are also other kinds of communities as well that I write about in the book. Thank you. I, I, uh, I have to admit that one reason I asked that question is because um, I too was in California during the Jesus Movement days. Oh, and and wow. some, some of your recollections really struck familiar chords with me, literally musical chords. Um, cause I was at Occidental going to uh, Christian assembly, four square church of God. I was at Fuller for a while. So even all your great old rehearsal of songs kind of brings, uh, great memories for me, even during the, even the charismatic experience in the Pentecostal churches. One of the ways, one of the ways I played piano was while people were singing in tongues and you haven't really played jazz piano until you've played piano while people are singing in tongues. So I love that. <laughs> 
So I was, I really appreciated your kind of circling back, Diana, to, to pick up some of those strains, some of that, um, maybe some, some people have, have moved on from there, but to, to really reappropriate that piece of your past is, it seems like an integrating kind of, kind of thing to do in your own, in your own journey, to use that word positively, journey. Yeah, you know, I I turned 62 just a couple weeks ago, so I've got um, six solid decades behind me now. And one of the things I felt I needed to do as an author and just, just as a human being is that I wanted to do a piece of integrating spiritual work. Um, you know, when you look back over your life, sometimes you leave pieces laying in the road or, you know, shove things in the attic that you don't want other people to know about. And certainly the years that I spent within the Bible church in Arizona and then at the Evangelical College in California. And uh, I didn't know about the Occidental piece because we were right up the road, you know, in Santa Barbara, not very far away, about an hour and 15 minutes drive and good traffic. Um, and so the uh, those years were really wonderful for me. And I, I it was sort of awkward in a sense because I was writing this book mostly over the last year. It went off to the editors um, for the final stuff in January. And so while I'm writing these sort of very rosy and very warm stories about white evangelicalism in the 1970s, you know, all this sort of terrible stuff is unfolding in, um, you know, sort of trend data and uh, political life where, you know, we all know now, you know, 80% of evangelicals voted for Donald Trump. And please, if there are any people who voted for Donald Trump in this audience, I do not hold any ill will against you personally. And I, and I love just being really open and free, you know, about our political opinions. Uh, but um, it's a little interesting to see a tradition that has gone so lockstep you know, in one public, at uh, one political, a religious tradition going lockstep into a political party. And of course, there's been a lot of criticism of white evangelicalism for participating in very non thinking ways in American racism and how white evangelicalism has underscored uh, white supremacy. So there's a, I, I can go over to Twitter right now if I if I wanted to open up the, my account and there would probably be somewhere between 15 and 25 t tweets criticizing white evangelicals. And yet here I was, you know, writing this, the, these two, actually it's basically two chapters that take place in that framework. And I was pulling out what was good about that, those years. And Oh my gosh, you know, the things I learned and the, a lot of the funniest stories in the book are actually in those uh, two chapters, you know, including the story where here I was very idealistic uh, sophomore in college and all of my friends decided that we wanted to give our whole hearts to Jesus. We wanted to follow Jesus, you know, to the ends of the earth. And we wanted to know what it meant to die to ourselves. What did Jesus mean when he said, if you're going to follow me, you have to die to yourself. And so my friends and I started a street ministry which is kind of hilarious if you know Santa Barbara, you know, <laughs> it's not like the center of poverty in Southern California, but we went down to the streets and like it's every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night and, so, and the weekends too. And we would just pick up street people. Um, one of the stories that I didn't put in the book because I was worried about the college is we used to bring people back to sleep in our in the, the lounges in our dorms who had no other place to sleep. And we got in trouble with the administration for bringing homeless people to the college. Um, but uh, there is a very funny story about me having a conversation with some ladies of the evening, as I euphemistically call them, uh, in my 1970s, very naive evangelical ease. And, um, um, and I almost got arrested uh, by the cops because they came and did a sweep. And I was a woman standing on a street corner with a whole bunch of prostitutes and they tried to put me in the back of the van and I'm standing there thinking, oh my gosh, I was just here witnessing to Jesus and what my parents, what am I going to say to my parents? How am I going to explain this? And uh, one of the, the women uh, turned around to the officer and said, um, oh, don't take her. 
and the, the the policeman said what and and the and the 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 lady said uh she's not one of us uh she's a she's a jesus girl and and at that point i was like wait a second, Jesus would go to jail with the people who are standing on the street corner. Put me, put me in the back of the van, you know? And then there was this other part of me was going, oh, whew, I don't have to say anything to my parents now. And so, so evangelicalism in the seventies and the sort of golden kind of tinted uh, Jesus movement, California evangelicalism was full of I think a lot of young people who are incredibly idealistic and who did stupid stuff like that all the time. And so I told many of those stories and, and um, I love that young woman. You know, I, I'm grateful I was her. I'm grateful she's still alive in me. And I'm really grateful for all the ways that she taught me something about Jesus. Thank you. You and I may have, you, we had to have seen each other at a concert at Knott's Berry Farm or something. Oh and my gosh, the Christian concerts at Berry, I, Knott's Berry Farm in Disneyland. That was just amazing stuff. I worked for First Presbyterian Church as a as an evangelist on the beaches of Catalina Island for a few summers. I went out there to get away from Georgia just to be in California and to find myself, but I ended up coming back to the Episcopal Church, of course. I, I was an Episcopalian out there, but I went everywhere. Let, let's turn to the other side, at the other side of the, um, the book, especially when you talk about the humanity of, of Jesus, and you talk about that uh, beautiful word, the way, and you mention a familiar verse for people who have been evangelical, and I agree with you, uh, the evangelicals in those days covered a lot of people. They were, they were conservative evangelicals, they were liberal ones. And, and like you, I read Ron Sider's books and Jim Wallace and, and um, the guy from Mississippi. In fact, I lived with the guy who started Post-American Community with Jim Wallace in Chicago. Oh, my. But, but a lot of different, a lot of evangelicals went one way and a lot went the other way. So mm -hmm. it, it's not, it doesn't pinpoint you. Talk a little bit about the humanity of Jesus and especially the way you've come to understand John chapter 14, verse 6 and what the way is for you. Well, in that verse, uh, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And that verse is often used as a what some people refer to as a clobber verse. You know, it's a, it's a powerful verse that people pull out of context. And we usually think of it in contemporary America as a verse of exclusion. And so people will say, oh, you know, unless you're a Christian, you're not going to go to heaven because Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so I, I did a little, um, you know, biblical exegesis, which I do, as you know, throughout the book. I, I run my experiences um, kind of through the lens of memory. And then I pick up those memories and weave together theology and biblical, uh, biblical studies with them in a more 60 year old voice. And so, so um, I wanted to just do a, a bit of analysis of that text. And the way that I thought about it was fairly simple. And that is Jesus in that part of the gospel of John is not concerned about what's going to happen to Buddhists, Muslims, Jews, or anybody else. I mean, this is not a text about world religions and whether or not people from those world religions are going to uh, be with God after they die. And so what the text is about is it's Jesus is hanging out with his friends and they know something is going wrong. And they're together, they're getting afraid of the Romans, they're getting afraid of the religious authorities, they're worried because Jesus is saying things that seem to indicate that he's not going to be around much longer, and so his friends are afraid that they're going to lose him, and so it's a, it's a, a whole section of scripture that's about comforting, and Jesus trying to tell his friends that even though things are about to change, uh, that love is always going to be part of who they are, that they are still going to be with him, even though it is going to be different. And in the context of that, this verse comes up, I am the way, the truth, the life. And I have come to believe that when Jesus says that, he's just sort of reminding them uh, 
of what they've discovered. You know, they've discovered this way of being in the world. They've discovered certainly truth. And the truth is not propositional, but it's relational. It's truth that is emerged in their friendships. And then, of course, um, they have a life that they never imagined they would have when they were fishermen or tax collectors or what have you. And then we get to the second part of the verse, except uh, no one comes to the Father except by me. Well, it's a really interesting word because it can mean exclusion, but it can also mean unless. And so in English, we would say, you know, just kind of making comments with our friends, we would say, oh, I would have been in, um, I would have been in hot water, except that my friend uh, took uh, responsibility for uh, the problems he created with my parents. And so in that sense, it's not about exclusion, but it's about someone doing something for you that opens up a possibility that didn't exist before. Or we say, oh, I would be so hot, except someone opened up the window. Now there's a nice breeze coming through. And so when you think about that word, except, it's really weird um, when we use it exclusively, because it's usually meant, you know, it's, it's sort of standard regular English to use it in a way that means someone has created a possibility for your life. And I think that within the context of the disciples being afraid, Jesus is creating the possibility for them to find hope um, when they're scared. And so, so th that's a much better reading of that text <laughs> than the one that I have typically been hit over the head with like a, a club. <laughs> So, so I try to do things like that all the time, take familiar bits of scripture and just turn uh, a good friend of mine who died about 20 years ago, who was a senior bishop in the Episcopal church. Uh, when I uh, uh, started writing books, uh, he gave me a prism and he said, hang this over your desk in a window. And I, and that's what I think about all the time when I'm reading scripture is that part of the calling of reading scripture is turning the prism of very familiar uh, texts and letting the light fall through them in new ways. And so as a writer, I'm always turning the prism so that my readers can see the light in a different way. I like that. I like that. Uh, I appreciate your regard for the Bible. I see some of these names on the screen and some of them are parts of my uh, Bible studies that we do several times a week at the cathedral. Uh, the Episcopal Church always reads the Bible, and uh, it's 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 fun to take those verses and really deep go deep into them and find out what they're saying. I've always said about that verse that Jesus doesn't say no one comes to the Father except through the church. He says except through me. Uh, uh, oftentimes, of course, we do identify Jesus and the church as the body of Christ, but that verse doesn't say the church is the way to the Father. It says Jesus. So there's a whole way to God that is not restricted. In fact, that's the way I thought you would have interpreted it with your th feelings about uh, church, uh, because it's certainly the way I've, I have uh, in interpreted it, even though I certainly do believe in church and participation and, and commitment. It really is. For me, the church really is a place where um, spiritual people get religion. It is <laughs> Uh, and in fact, that's what I'm preaching about this Sunday. The, it, it's good to be spiritual. And the purpose of spirituality is to be religious, to put things back together like Ezekiel's bones, to kind of to have a to have a community, to be in in, in touch with each other. Um, th and that's part of the reason I, I was asking about your own church um, uh, participations and, 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 and commitments. The. How have you experienced community or let's say spiritual community during this year, Diana? It's been a tough year. It's, it's been hard to see people and touch people and hug people and to kind of have the give and take of community. How has that gone? Um, it's, uh, it's been mixed, I would say. Uh, on one hand, the the spiritual practice that has kept me most centered is the the one I wrote about in my 
last book, which who knew when I was writing a book on gratitude, how important that would become uh, for this, this year. And it really has helped me through. Um, but that's not about community. That's really more about me practicing gratitude. And, and it does happen sometimes in community, but it's also a solo practice. I think that the places where I've found community most uh, strongly, interestingly enough, have been reaching out to friends, including people that are new friends, by these technological means. And um, there was one time when I was just woefully depressed uh, because it was, you know, the, the Episcopal Church made all kinds of decisions about Eucharist. And I, I, I was not happy with those decisions. I wrote about those and I, and I talked about them. And, um, it, and that was good. I needed to get some of that conversation going um, in, in our communion. But it also meant that there were no Episcopal churches who were doing any kind of table Eucharist um, here in the Diocese of Virginia that, or I, that I, I attend. Uh, so I was bemoaning that uh, one day on Twitter. And um, of all things, <laughs> so sweet, Anne Lamott popped into my Twitter thread and said, um, Diana, how about if you come to my Presbyterian church this weekend? And so I did. They sent me a link to go to Anne's little tiny Presbyterian church, which is in Marin County, California. And I went to her church. There were less than, I don't know, there were less than 40 people there. And they loved each other so much. And the pastor is, a, is this amazing African-American woman. And she literally sat in her living room and read her sermon. And right behind her was her husband. And he played the guitar. And, it, and then we did communion together. And it was the sweetest thing I think it was the one communion service of the last year. And I went to several in different denominations, uh, but it was the one service that the warmth and the friendship of those people just exuded over the internet. And it was very obvious that Jesus was there. So, so I found moments like that along the way. And who, who would ever guess in a thousand years that Anne Lamont would invite me to church? You know? <laughs> And it was wonderful. So, and we got to be better friends because of it. So it was, it was amazing. That's sweet. Sometimes, uh, again, my experience of church is really, I don't care whether you call it a church or a parish or call it a community. That's where we get in touch with humanity. And I, I liked your uh, talking about humanity, your own child, and of course your, your time with your mother, uh, with some of the frailties of, of humanity. And you you have a great section on a on a on the word bowels, which is my favorite Greek word because it's the word that really sounds like what it means. It's the Greek word splankna, which is the which is that heart that uh, as you it's your soul that you kind of get in touch with, and a lot of times that comes through this interaction with with regular with regular people. Not always the best people, but the real people. <laughs> it's it's funny to have a life that can move from, you know, being on the street with a group of prostitutes, remembering that experience, and then being over Zoom with Anne Lamont, you know, and it's it's like that whole range of human experience. And I think as I've gotten older, uh, and th this shows up in the book in an interesting way, I think, is that the one of the early chapters is about me sitting in a circle in a Methodist Sunday school room when I'm about three years old. And my favorite Sunday school teacher is there and she's say, telling the story about how Jesus loves all the little children and holds up a picture of Jesus surrounded by little kids. And as I went back during the editing process and read the book over again, I realized that as I go through my life, the circles keep showing up and they keep getting wider. And that often when they're getting wider, I have this moment of like, oh, can I go here? You know, are these people acceptable? Is this idea permissible? And sometimes I stop and I retreat somewhat because I get afraid. But then at least the way my life has work is, worked is that even when I've been afraid and I've retreated from the wider circle, something keeps calling me back and I'd love to say that that's the Holy Spirit. I truly believe it is. 
calls me back to a wider circle and a wider circle. And so finally I get to a point in the book at the very end where I'm sitting on a stage in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. It's 2015, so not terribly long ago. And I'm in a circle of 20 women at the World's Parliament of Religion. And I'd been invited to give the keynote, one of the keynote addresses. It was a big celebration keynote morning. And all those 20 women got to give a 10 to 15 minute talk out of their tradition. And there were only two Christians, just two, in the circle. Uh, one was me. And the other one, of course, this makes some sense, was a Mormon. And, you know, we're in Salt Lake City. And so, so there I was representing how many billions of Christian women in the world. And um, I loved it. I don't name these people by name in the book because it sounded too much like name dropping. But it, was, it gives the audience, the people who are here tonight, a little bit of a sense of how far my life came from the little tiny Sunday school circle to one side of me was Deepak Chopra's daughter. And then two chairs down from me was Malcolm X's granddaughter. <laughs> and um, I, I would have never anticipated that in that Sunday school room in Baltimore in 1963. But that's where my life has gone. And, and, the, and the wideness, I mean, I just think about some of those words in scripture too, when we're talking, when, when it's, we're introduced to the idea of the wideness of God's love. And in our hymnody, that word shows up quite a bit. The, the wideness of the circle and how in that place there is God and there is Jesus. And I say that very specifically at the end of the book. I have not compromised on my friendship with Jesus or my, as we like to use the word, my relationship with Jesus through the whole of the journey. Uh, but instead, that very relationship calls my heart into places I did not imagine. That's beautiful. Have you, have you read any of the work of Ken Wilbur? I have. Well, what you're talking about, especially in this book, you mentioned James Fowler and how you didn't like his linear psychological or spiritual development. Ken Wilber, as you know, has a spiral sense of, of uh, spiritual development, which is that circle that you're talking about, a widening circle, but it keeps on going back and integrating itself, which is, it seems to me, been part of the project of this book, a kind of uh, talking about your life as an ever widening circle that integrates all the best of the previous circles. Well, thank you. And I have read Wilbur and uh, that book uh, uh, about sp spiritual, di uh, I, I can't remember what it's called, uh, the but there's another one called Spiral Dynamics too, that's very much in the same vein. And so I read them and it, it made a little bit more sense to structure the book around Fowler because we human beings experience our lives in chronological time. And and I thought that the, the, the Fowler kind of set um, is a fairly, con is something that would be accessible to many, many readers um, in the United States. But I always have in the back of my mind those other kinds of spiritual um, uh, sort of growth models. And um, another one that's been really in influential in my thinking is a book that was written in the late 80s um, by a psychologist named Mary Belenke. And the book is called Women's Ways of Knowing. And so part of uh, the thread also that does run through my book is, uh, is a little bit about how women's spirituality develops along some very particular pathways <laughs> that are a little different than, than those of, of men. And so, so it's a book that integrates some of that uh, really interesting material in spiritual development. And some people here might be familiar with the fact that Brian McLaren just wrote a book called Faith and Doubt. Um, Brian is such a wonderful writer. And uh, he uses a very similar kind of framework. And that's because we figured that out together. <laughs> we were actually sitting um, at on a porch in Wyoming. We had been leading a retreat together and it, Brian had just turned 60. I was just on the shy side of 60. And we started talking about how we might integrate spiritual development literature into our next books. <laughs> so, so people keep saying to me, did you know your book sounds like Brian McLaren's? And I said, oh, what a surprise. <laughs> it was planned. 
<laughs> so it's it's uh it's time to open the forum up for other questions at the past time in fact i think um mary hare is going to let other people who are on this screen make comments or ask questions so so mary hare is it your turn to take over well um there haven't been any comments as yet but if you have a question or a comment the chat room is open and feel free to put something down and if i if nothing appears i say this is a great discussion if everybody else agrees um and we can continue with the two of you just giving us lots of insights and information and um you know, if there's a question, I'll interrupt. But if you're, if you feel, if everybody is agreeable to that, we can go ahead and do that. I'm actually perfectly happy if someone wants to to ask a question. Um, I don't know if that is like so so out of the the water that uh, that it would freak people out. But um, you know, raised hand with a, a question or clarification is always something I rejoice in as a teacher. So we're just on mute. Don't see anything yet. So if you two want to continue, I'm ready to listen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've got lots of questions, or at least lots of comments. Uh, I, one of the things I was really looking forward to you mentioning, you didn't mention it, was your on the first chapter of on friendship. I say, and especially with your use of some of the early Christian matriarchs and patriarchs, uh, I, I was looking for your mention of Elred Riveau, who wrote a, a very beautiful book called Spiritual Friendship, where he ends up saying, God is friendship. Um, it, it, it's, it's uncertain whether he actually said that. The book is done as a kind of dialogue, and one of the other characters says, God is friendship, and ask and ask Elred what to what he thinks about it, and he he essentially accepts it. But um, and I and I felt like you were saying that. Would you say that God is friendship? I would, and I I read that book in as I was working on this chapter, and um, it's funny. Some people here might be getting Richard Rohr's meditations this week, and they've all been on God and friendship. And so Richard's been talking about like Richard of St. Victor and some other people in the tradition who wrote about friendship. Um, and there's always this sort of moment as a writer when you have to figure out how much you're going to put in other people's voices and how much you're going to keep in your own. And so throughout the book, different figures from theology and church history and and contemporary um, writings uh, pop in. Uh, but I tried very closely to keep the narrative in my voice. And so if you felt I said that God is friendship, I did say God is friendship. I was intending that. And uh, that my sense of that was affirmed um, by these older, beautiful, mostly medieval writers, uh, was important to me. So it gave me a sense of confidence, you know, hey, I'm on, I'm, on, I'm on the right path here and I've got some good friends that I can agree with. Now we do have a couple comments. Good. First, we have a question. How did you respond immediately to the voice to free Jesus? And <laughs> how are you doing this now? I freaked out. <laughs> I literally... Well, you know, my first thing was, is somebody else here? And then my, my, you know, my second thing was, is that you, Jesus? And then my third point in that moment was I did then hear someone coming down the aisle of the National Cathedral. And, you know, I looked over my shoulder and it was a priest. And the last thing I needed was the idea, sorry, Sam, but a priest coming in and hearing Jesus talking to me. It was like, this was not something I wanted to deal with. So I bolted out of the National Cathedral. So apparently that's how I responded to the voice of Jesus. I run away. And... and um, you know, that sounds perfectly logical to me. And, and um, you know, there are other times when certainly the, the thing that really stands out about that first, that incident that's at the beginning of the book is I haven't often heard 
a kind of out loud, you know, sort of God voice with a direction. As a matter of fact, I, I get a little worried about that. You know, when people tell me that God spoke to them, when paintings speak to you, I mean, that's a really troubling thing. Um, so when I would say that I've heard the voice of Jesus before, it's often been in the voice of a friend. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam's asked me a lot of questions about community. Um, I've felt the sort of the promptings or the whispers of God um, in community and then also in and through nature. And so, you know, walking along the beach or beautiful sun, sunrise or sunset. And I think that uh, God and specifically Jesus really does speak to us um, through all of these different ways. And part of growing in faith is learning how to be attentive. Yes, we expect Jesus to show up in sermons or a formal liturgy. Um, but Jesus shows up in these other ways too. And it's, it's often those, co especially conversations with friends, you know, you seem to hear the very thing that you most needed to hear your friends say that pulls you towards something else. And so there are times when I hear those voices, when I feel convicted. Sometimes I hear those voices and I feel really joyful. Uh, sometimes I feel them, see, hear them and I feel, like I said, kind of afraid and want to run away. So it, it really depends um, on the situation. And I, I just urge people to sort of listen to where those whispers and where those sort of inclinations and, and those inner promptings arise. And that's more often my experience of hearing the voice of Jesus. This one was odd, but <laughs> You know, okay. hey, we, we have another question. They want to know, who are you reading today that's making a difference in your life? Oh, that is a really good question. I have done some reading um, over the pandemic. I've gone back to reading some Southern history. A book I liked very much this year was Heather Cox Richardson's book on how the South won the Civil War, uh, which um, I, I found to be a very rewarding um, historical book. I like uh, my friend uh, Robert Jones's book um, on white supremacy and the church. I, I enjoy that. Um, there are a couple of manuscripts that I got to read in advance. Um, Anthea Butler, who teaches at the University of Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. A, has an amazingly critical uh, book out right now of white evangelicalism. And, it's, and, and we've laughed that for the first time I write something nice about white evangelicalism and she comes out with this book that's just a just an assault on that tradition. And, um, and Thea and I are very good friends. And so um, we're kind of polyphonic, I think, truths um, about white evangelicalism. So, so that's been a good book. I've spent an enormous amount of time reading poetry. David White, um, Mark Nepo, um, Maya Angelou, you know, kind of the big names, but people I love, um, Mary Oliver, Denise Levertov. Um, these are voices that inform me spiritually and as a writer. So, so some about race, some about history, um, not too much theology, because I, I work in theology. So I, when I want to read a book, um, I generally go into a sort of a different direction. Um, and I love mysteries. And so um, I usually have some mystery novel on my... We've gotten some more questions, one of which is, which Ken Wilber book would be best to read first? Oh, my gosh. You know, I'd have to go back there and dig dig it up. Sam, can you remember the title of that book we were talking about? I can't at the top, off the top of my head. All Spiral Dynamics. That's the one I was, I was mentioning. Is He's that the one? Yeah, but he's got a he's got a couple. You're right. I can't remember the spiral dynamics is a good entry. Yeah. Okay. Another question: What would you say to a teenage daughter who has been raised an Episcopalian but is now rebelling against God and religion? Ooh, this is a specialty of mine. <laughs> I have a 23 year old daughter. <laughs> uh, um. You know, I always go easy on people when they are in any kind of state like that. You know, the last thing people need is for the church to move in and seem more judgmental rather than, than less. And so 
you know, my daughter would get to a point with us and when she, you know, didn't want to go to church, we, we had kind of a tough time. I don't want to tell too many stories on her, uh, but we certainly had a tough time when she was uh, between 15 and 17. It was endless amounts of pressure against me in particular. I think that works with moms and teenage daughters. And um, I just spent time asking her questions that were non-judgmental questions like, oh, why, why do you think that? Or um, if you don't believe in God anymore, how would you explain what you believe in? Or, you know, what's, what's important to you right now? And so I asked lots of those kinds of questions, which gave her opening to not feel judged and to um, tell me her story where she is, was then. And uh, when she told me that I did a lot of listening and no correcting. And so those were ways that we navigated through those choppy, choppy waters. So I have, I have one uh, daughter uh, from uh, Richard and I have been married now for 25 years and uh, he was married before and he has a, a son from previous marriage. So I have a 31 year old stepson and a 23 year old daughter and they're kind of perfect illustrations of their generation. My stepson doesn't go to church. Um, and is a little worried about religion. And he's married to a woman who grew up fundamentalist and hates religion. So that's an interesting uh, dynamic. And uh, we love them very much. And uh, then my daughter, I asked her recently, I said, honey, what's, uh, can you tell me some of your first memories of Jesus? People keep asking me this question about her um, in context of this book. Because I do think that depending on how old you are, and sort of how you were raised, you might have very different memories of Jesus, not these nice things of Jesus's friend that I tell in my book. And so she literally told me. I want to thank you for oops. acknowledging. There's somebody who's talking. I don't know where that came from. But uh, so, so anyway, my daughter, she was just so wonderful because um, I asked her, you know, what, what are your memories of Jesus? And, and she told me one that has to do with waving at Jesus in stained glass windows when she, uh, Easter Sunday, when she was teeny tiny. But the next one was, she said, you know, mom, the most sort of important theological memory I have of Jesus is, she said, I don't know how old I was. I, she said, maybe five or six years old. It was a godly play. And we were sitting in the a sandbox, the place where they, you know, draw the, make these stories. They had a sandbox in the, her godly play classroom. And um, the teacher asked us to, to write on these little pieces of paper, um, sort of signs, things that Jesus would would say to us if Jesus was here now. And I guess they were making like a little Palm Sunday parade or something of these signs. And so I said, oh, that's interesting. She said, my sign said, impeach Bush. <laughs> <laughs> she just, she, this is my daughter. You have no idea how much that's my daughter. And um, she, she, she was around Virginia Seminary. It was the beginning of the Iraq war. All of the people who she knew who were priests were opposed to the war. And you know, my, her dad and I were just like all over like the moon. We couldn't believe this was happening. And so her Jesus was directing all the other little kids in the class that Jesus wanted us to impeach Bush. <laughs> so my daughter has this beautiful vision of a social justice Jesus that just blows my justice Jesus out of the water. And so when it comes to thinking about the faith of someone who's younger than me, my own kids, I go to school and I'm not the teacher <laughs> when it comes to my daughter. She turns around, she's the professor. And um, I have so much admiration for her and her faith commitments that there are no words. Uh, here's another question that sort of ties into that. And we're, we're getting some questions. It's really yeah. kind of cool. Um, what suggestions can you give for hearing the voice of Jesus in all the political rhetoric? Oh, gosh. Well, there's a lot of clutter, isn't there? Um, I have the most simple rule of thumb, and that is voices that wend their way wend away from violence and towards love are really the first voices that you should 
listen to. And um, love is not sappy and love is not sentimental. Um, love is about loving your neighbor. Sometimes love is about saying things that are unpopular. Uh, love is about taking a stand when no one else will oftentimes. And so I'm not talking here about sort of simple, uh, a simple adjudication between love and violence. I'm talking about really looking deep. And uh, sometimes we hear voices of anger that sound like they might be voices of love, but that they're, or ang uh, of violence, but that they're really voices of love because someone is so hurt or so full of passion about justice that their first voice is the one that comes out just, you know, full of, of rage. And sometimes we have to learn to sit with those voices and realize that the rage is emerging from a deep sense of compassion, mm -hmm. of neighborly love, and for um, even the compassion for their own souls, which feel violated. And I think we've seen a lot of that this week. I watching television some and listening to different African-American commentators and writers that I really like just losing it. I mean, and rightfully so, losing it about some of these episodes of violence against young black men. And and at first it sounds like it's mean and it's angry and all that kind of stuff, but it's really because of love and wanting a more loving society. So, so those are the things I look for. And then there are other voices that you can really hear, you know, that are angry voices and, and you know that they're about personal power or that you know that they're about excluding people or you know that they're about um you know just sort of protection and not about that wide circle so those are the ways that i i do it but it's the the first test is the simplest test is this voice moving toward love compassion and that wide table or is it um functioning out of a sense of fear now here's another one. How, what, who helps you cope with the suffering that's been caused by the pandemic most recently? White supremacy, income disparity, gun violence, which does not get us closer to gun control? Well, you know, you list all those things and the, the first thing that strikes me, I'm looking at the, the um, comment in the chat um, is that those are not separate issues that those are interrelated mm -hmm. concerns and they're they're they are interrelated around what I was actually just talking about is that a lot of the you know income disparity is between people functioning out of a kind of a financial zero-sum game and that is people wanting to get as much as they can to themselves because they're afraid that someone's going to take something away from them. And so um, the structuring of our economy has made the richest people richer and the poorest people poorer and actually has plunged the middle class down um, along the way. You know, that's, that's about fear. And it's about uh, protection in the worst senses of the words. And a lot of it's based on race. And so gun violence, of course, is an issue that's very complicated in the racial history of the United States. And, um, you know, all the authors who have been teaching us about white supremacy along the way. So what I see when I see those questions together is I see a set of, of concerns that emerge out of fear. Um, fear of a changing culture, fear of a more diverse society, a fear that there's not going to be enough and that we have to get ours first. And so um, the, those things, boy, f that kind of fear and the violence that comes from fear really does cause an enormous amount of suffering. And um, the way that I cope with those things is, you know, one, I participate in social movements and uh, ways that I can uh, that help to alleviate that fear. 
and also strengthen the voices of the people who feel like they've been excluded. And I feel like that's really important um, to do. I've learned to listen better than I have before. I know that my own journey around some of these issues has been um, hard. Um, I grew up in Baltimore in the 1960s, folks. Uh, I got to tell you, it is that 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 might have been the most outright racist place to be yeah. in um, all of Baltimore's long history of racism. And so that was my childhood environment. And um, I used to watch my grandfather uh, send black people around the back door of his store because he didn't want um, black people to tread in the front door of the floor shop for some reason. And so, so these are things that I think that part of the suffering that emerges out of this is, um, you know, our inability to cope with it because we haven't really dealt with it within ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so the more I go into my own story and try to understand that and correct what I've done wrong and participate in the other, in, in, in making a better story for the future, that helps me to be able to cope with the suffering. But, you know, I spend plenty of time crying and praying and yelling at the television, um, like a lot of people do, but you just keep going. And most folks that I know who are really just incredible activists also have very deep spiritual lives and the 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 two wells the well of suffering and the well of the the anger and grief over suffering and the well of joy um run side by side and and um you know there's a lot of language in activism that says just joy is justice and justice is joy and um I hold that. I really treasure. I really treasure that kind of wisdom that mostly comes out of African American theology. We've got a few comments that I want to share with everybody. One is I've always wanted to count the number of times Jesus said, "Fear not," or "Be not, be not afraid." Beautiful, perfect. Fear is the source of so many ills. Yeah, it really is, and. Um, one of the things that happens in freeing Jesus is I, I was talking about how my circles widen and then they constrict, they widen, they constrict, et cetera, is that there are several episodes that uh, in the book where I, when I go backwards out of fear, something truly awful happens. Um, I make a terrible decision. Uh, there's actually a section in the book in chapter five, when I apologize to people who knew me at that particular moment, which would have been in my early 30s, uh, for all of the awful things uh, that I said out of my own sense of fear. And um, and yeah, fear is the thing that keeps the circle from, from moving through the world. And I think that's no accident that those angels keep showing up all over the Bible uh, saying, you know, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. Because if you are, fear almost always has a trajectory towards violence, whether it's self-violence and self-abuse mm -hmm. or violence towards others. And um, no Christian can, can stay there and be healthy in any way, shape or form. We, we have to keep moving towards courage and compassion. Um, another comment was, it's hard to ask a question when I haven't read the book, followed by Sam's questions and comments have led to great discussion, great conversation. Thank you. Um, oh, that's so sweet. Of course, yes, it is hard to ask a question when you haven't read a book, but, yeah. you know. And then during the course of these conversations and questions that are asked, we come up with some questions ourselves. Um, let's see, there were a couple more things um, does anybody else have any more questions? I'm not, um, thank you for this evening of wisdom. I'm I like the person who's almost out of battery on her phone. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Marcy. <laughs> well, Marcy, it's being recorded, so you are in luck. Um, here's a great way to draw the discussion to a conclusion. 
I love that the first chapter is friend and the end is presence. Yeah. So this has been, do you have any more comments, Sam or Diana? No, thank you for your time, Diana. I, I wish we could see you in person and uh, we'll look forward to you coming back to Atlanta one day or coming back to the cathedral. Uh, thanks for your writing. Oh, well, it will be wonderful to be back with you. And uh, it's just so much a, a pleasure to be able to share a new book with people who care about these kinds of issues. And um, I hope that I hope that people will read, of course, because every author hopes that, you know, she dreams of sharing her stories with the world. Uh, but most of all, I hope you'll take it as an invitation. And it's an invitation, not just to know my story, but it's an Every great spiritual memoir is about, is about you thinking of your story. Mm -hmm. And it's when we put all of those stories together that we begin to really get, I think, a sense of the larger story um, in which we live. And for those of us who are Christian, that means how our stories together uh, create the story of Jesus in these days. And so... Um, read, but also know your own story and let it speak deeply to you and let that story be a place of healing. Well, this has been perfectly wonderful and it's been full of insight, wisdom, grace, compassion, love. Um, and that being so, I feel it appropriate to close with a prayer I'd be happy to do that, except we have a clergy person here. And <laughs> Sam, are you comfortable with pulling one out of the air? A prayer for us to close the session. It's been just delightful. Thank you both very much for your time and your wisdom and um, your willingness to share all that you've said. I would be happy to pray. There, there's a lot of people who can pray better than I, but I will pray at the drop of a hat and at the turn of a key. Okay. And, I, and part of my prayer is exactly the way uh, Diana uh, closed her comments. Uh, this kind of theology, memoir theology, means we all have an entry into it. And so as we think about our own turning points, our own crisis points, things that happen in our lives, they're all opportunities to experience Jesus in a, in a new way. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your gift of life and your gift of friendship and presence and salvation and teaching and the way. Thank you for the gift of, of Diana Butler Bass tonight, the gift of the Cathedral Bookstore. And may this last hour or so be a time for us to have experienced grace and to be somehow inspired and to have some imagination about looking at our own lives again and how our lives tell us more about your love and your grace and your hope. We go forth in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, thanks, thanks be to God. Amen. Thank, thank you all so much. All very, very much. Blessings and love. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.